I was talking about this, and a friend sent me a, a picture of a, a billboard on the side of a, uh, a general contractor's site sign uh, for doing a, a residential multi-unit project. Underneath the sign, free architecture. Episode 85. This is The Business of Architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Hello and welcome back, Architect Nation, to the Business of Architecture. Listen, if you're not already signed up for Business of Architecture Insider, I encourage you to go over to Business of Architecture. There's a link there where you can join our community, get our newsletter that I send out on a regular basis that has all the latest things we're discussing on the show as well, the greatest insights from the experts we have on. Support for the Business of Architecture show is provided by BQE Software, the developers of ArchiOffice, the number one office and product management software for architects. And here's an exclusive offer for you, my loyal podcast listeners. Until December 31st, BQE is offering you the chance to win an all-new iPad Mini when you attend a live demo. It's that simple. Now, this is a pretty good chance for you to win one of these iPad Minis, but even better, this is a great chance for you to take a look at this revolutionary groundbreaking software that can help you run a more profitable and flexible practice. You can claim your demo by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo, but you have to do it before the end of the year. Once again, that's businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. And in addition, you'll get the chance to win that iPad mini. So last week we spoke with Craig Park, and today we're going to continue that conversation. Craig Park is a principal of the Sexton Group. He leads their Midwest operations office in his, in his town of Omaha, Nebraska. In addition, Craig has a long history of working with the Society for Marketing Professional Services, business development for architecture firms, and also for the technology consultancy firms that he's worked for over his his career. He's the author of The Architecture of Value, Building Your Professional Practice, which is recommended reading for the SMPS CPSM accreditation program. And in 2013, the architecture of image, branding your professional practice. So if you caught last week's episode, you caught the fact that Craig had some great insights to share about presenting ourselves, about making the client relationship be something of of lasting value. Craig, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Ian. It's great to be back. Yeah, of course, between us, it's only been about three or four minutes, but for our listeners, it's been about a week. (laughs) Yeah, that works. Possibly. I like time travel. Yep. Now, Craig, in addition to your work with technology firms, you've also worked in a leadership capacity as marketing director for several architecture firms. Is that correct? That's correct. I was the uh, chief marketing officer for Fields Devereaux, uh, Architects and Engineers in Los Angeles, a 200-person practice with uh, four offices, and then subsequently uh, uh, the chief marketing officer for Leo A. Daily uh, here in Omaha, a uh, 1,200-person AE practice. Uh, with about 30 offices around the country. Um, and uh, so I had spent most of my uh, career up until that point, um, 2003, 2002, when I joined uh, uh, Fields Devereaux, uh, working in te- as a technology consultant to hundreds of architects, uh, but uh, had a passion for marketing. I, I think the, the process of telling our story in order to gain uh, the respect and trust of our clients uh, was one that uh, really resonated with me. I, I tell the story when I get on stage and give presentations that I'm an architect by training, a uh, technologist by practice, but a marketer by passion. Mm. Uh, and uh, really the experience of uh, leading that marketing effort for both Fields Devereaux, which is now known as Harley Ellis Devereaux, uh, was a merger, as a re- I think, a, a much of a result of of our efforts during the time I was there to grow the practice. We, uh, like many good practices, we got the attention of a larger firm who came in and, and merged with us and created a national practice. Uh, so they're now a, about a 600-person firm with offices in the Midwest and, and the West Coast. Um, so, Well, as you say, it's a universally applicable skill. You mentioned marketing. Yeah. And, and I would say, you know, marketing is, a, is an umbrella term, uh, depending on, on where, you, where you fit in the organization. Uh, uh, I always con- consider it's the umbrella over the communication process, the way that we tell our stories on the web, in the articles we write, in our brochure material, uh, even down to our job site signage. How do we tell 
who we are to the world um, in a variety of ways. Um, and then there's the uh, part of it is public relations, the part that pushes that out in a more formal way to the media to hopefully get the attention of a larger audience uh, through a third party, through someone else, having an article published in Architectural Record or, or one of the other trade journals or in the, you know, even better, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. Um, and uh, then uh, there's the part that is the business development side or the client development side. How do you build relationships with those target clients that fit within the niche that your firm is trying to achieve, you know, where you, where you serve best? Many architects are generalist, and so those niches might be broad and have multi, multiple vertical markets in which they serve. But even within those, you need to have the, the relevant stories to tell those clients uh, to gain uh, their interest and their trust over time. Uh, and then there's that last piece of the uh, uh, SMPS, the Society for Marketing Professional Services, identifies six domains of marketing that you need to be um, cognizant of and, and skilled in to be successful. And those are uh, market research. So where are you going to work? What markets will you serve? Market planning. How are you going to go to market? Um, communication, client, uh, the collateral uh, development of, of how are you going to tell your story? Client development and information uh, management. Um, uh, and, and there's a PR slice in there. Uh, uh, so that's the six. Uh, what they I always say there's a seventh. And the seventh is the one that architects hate the most. It's called sales. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the S word is, uh, it's why we call it business development, because we certainly don't want to call it sales. Uh, but in fact, what you are doing is you can't put, uh, I used to say you can't put pencil to paper. Today, um, is you can't put uh, mouse to uh, uh, to screen uh, uh, unless you're you've sold something. So it is a process of recognizing I'm going to get to the point where a client and, and I can come to an agreement that I can provide a service, um, they can afford the service, or they see value in the in the cost of that service, and at the end of the day, we'll have a successful project. So. Tell me, Craig, how you went from leading a technology consultancy group or working in that industry to jumping over and being the marketing director for a prominent firm. Well, I had, um, uh, and again, it's a part of, uh, I've always been willing to share what I know in, in public venues. Um, and I've looked for uh, opportunities to publish uh, projects. Uh, I will tell a short story. Um, back in the early 90s, I had uh, written internal uh, content for, for newsletters for the firms that I worked with about the projects in which I worked. Uh, and uh, one of our business consultants, uh, a, a gentleman you know, Pat Bell, um, uh, had come to me and said, you know, you publish a lot internally and you write a lot of our marketing content. Have you ever thought about publishing in, in the trade press? And I said, no. And I looked at the magazines that I read, and I saw an editor that I respected based on the content in his magazine, and I wrote an article about three projects. I wrote the, the larger picture of the process of developing uh, the kinds of technology-rich projects we did, and then I used three projects to illustrate um, the benefits and results of the work we did. Uh, and it was 2,500 words. It had pictures. It had drawings. And I sent it to the magazine with a little letter. I um, thought you might be interested in publishing this article. And a few weeks later, the phone rang and the editor said, Craig, you know, that's not the way it works. You have to look at my editorial calendar. You have to figure out where you have an article that fits in my calendar. You have to give me a paragraph about what that article is going to be about. Then I'll consider it and, and then I'll let you know and then we'll negotiate. And mostly it's going to be 1,000 to 1,200 words because that's how long a magazine article is. That's all people will spend the time to read. What you sent me is way too much, way too soon. Um, and I'm waiting for the sorry, you know, try again when he said, but it's one of the best articles I've ever read. So we're going to split it into two parts and we'll publish it in the next two issues. And I want you to start writing for me on a regular basis. So, you know, it, oh, you, the, the, the guts to take the chance, I mean, take, have the guts to take the chance. You'll get lots of rejection letters. I was fortunate on my first try to, to hit a home run. Uh, that's rare. Uh, and I've certainly been turned down in the past when I would make pitches to other magazines for similar similar process, but um, that started an idea. And so I had a, then I had a venue in which to write. Um, and that editor ultimately a few years later went to another magazine and took me with him, called me and said, hey, I'm going to this other magazine. I want you to be a byline columnist. 
So I don't want you to do project articles anymore. I want you to write opinion articles. And you can write about anything you want. Um, and I and this was 1996, and I, and we had just everybody was logging into the internet. We all had email addresses. We were building websites, and or we were at the beginning of the websites. But we were certainly communicating with that those tools. And I was really intrigued with the idea of collaboration across multiple about across distance with multiple disciplines. So I I wrote a, a column for many years called Virtuality. How do we hmm. per perform as virtual teams where, you know, we, this is the way we will see each other. You'll be doing a building project in Vassalia. I'll be the technology consultant in Omaha. We will never meet face to face and yet we'll have an effective interaction. Our client will get an end result. The client might be in Costa Rica. Um, how do we do that effectively using technology? And that became the focus of about five years of a monthly columns um, and that spanned everything from practice uh, of how do you communicate, how do you negotiate, uh, to marketing, how do you then tell the story, uh, to leadership, how do you develop your team, how do you have, uh, you know, for all of our practices, if they're going to be sustainable, we have a group of uh, people, as I did, as a young architect coming up through an organization, um, that will ultimately end up being in that leadership role. How do we groom those people, recognize leadership talent, encourage them to take more responsibility, teach them how to manage others. Um, all of those are part of the practice, not just the designing the great building, but the part of the practice of growing a firm and enduring practice. And those have been the themes of the, of the books is, is I'm fascinated with the process of building a practice that will last beyond the founders, um, beyond the initial need, uh, uh, the, or the idea that sparked the the founding of the firm. So, so did the, did the firm, so let's get back to the story about the firm. How did you make that transition were we, were you getting to that, Craig? Yeah, yeah. So I, um, I, uh, I, I had worked in technology, um, and I had a, I, I had a bad work experience. Uh, I, and I'll share that with the with the audience. I worked for a firm. I got recruited to work for a Fortune 500 company um, to start a design and engineering practice inside of a, a 500 million dollar manufacturing company that made products for the architectural industry in technology. Um, and they thought, the CEO thought, oh, what a great idea to have an architect leading the marketing of our products to the developer community and to the architects about getting our, our stuff in their projects. Um, the reality of working for a, a publicly held Fortune 500 company is they are measured by boxes out the door, um, sales going out of the warehouse every month. And they're in publicly traded, they're measured every quarter with the results the, of that they can publish to Wall Street. Um, and as you know, many architectural projects take two to three years to develop. They certainly take two to three years to from first design to opening door. Often they take longer to develop. And that did not work in the sales cycle, the, the supply chain, as they would say it in manufacturing, of how we do work. Um, and it became pretty clear pretty quick. I thought the challenge to do it was, was really great. To me, it was a really great opportunity, and I was really uh, happy to take it on. But I would say nine months into it, my, the people that I worked with at the executive level and I sat down and said, you know, it was a great idea that no one can make work because it just violates everybody um, in, the, in the value chain is, is against us in this. We're not re able to really be successful. So um, I was fortunate that I um, uh, got a six-month full-paid sabbatical. Um, uh, at the end of that um, hmm. first year. Hmm. Um, and I had, so I'm at that point, and as we all, uh, many of us reach, and I will call that my midlife crisis moment. Um, I've been a successful technology consultant for 25 years. I now have six months to rethink uh, my life at a, at a good salary where I can afford to take the time. I don't need to go immediately back to work. And um, I had start, I'd been writing these and speaking on marketing professional services. And um, my friend, Pat Bell, um, uh, encouraged me to, uh, to have a consulting practice much like his, where he advises firms on uh, practice, uh, uh, project management practice, leadership uh, marketing. And I started that in L.A. And uh, after about three months, I had eight clients. And one of them was Fields Devereaux, uh, the 200-person uh, firm in town. And Peter Devereaux, after a couple of weeks of talking, said, you know, 
um, we think what your your consulting ideas are really great, but we don't want to rent you. We want to buy you. So we'd like to create a, a position called chief marketing officer uh, because we're creating a we're modeling our firm after the C-suite model. So if you think of CEO, COO, uh, CIO, CMO, mm-hmm. CMO um, that was a fit in the in the C-suite model he was developing. He saw that as the as the natural evolution of the larger architectural practices was to model what corporate America was doing. Uh, and so he said, would you come on board and be our CMO? And, and I said, well, you know, my business model was to consult to, to firms because we, we are, a, we're, we're perfect. We're, we have four offices, we have three business lines, we have seven vertical markets. You'll be able to be, you know, you'll have the variety of kinds of challenges of marketing that you would if you had 10 or 11 clients mm. all within a regular paycheck. And help <laughs> You're thinking that this sounds pretty, pretty nice. <laughs> that sounds pretty good to me. As my as as my uh, six month severance uh, uh, was wrapping up, um, I thought that you know now I will have a full time gig. So um, that was the the gave me the and I and I continued and wrapped up the consulting practice I was doing with the other firms, and I still consult as Craig Park Consulting uh, with firms now and again, and more with. Uh, national associations and other things where I do some mar- marketing advice. Well, most of what I do today is the kind of, you know, the work I we do with our clients at Sexton, but I still have a, a little side uh, bit where I write, I speak, and I, I consult. But the, uh, that was my first foray into the formal role of a marketing leader. We were able to grow the firm. This is 2003 to 2006. Um, substantially increase the amount of, uh, of sales and revenue that we were generating. And we had an alliance with a firm in Detroit um, that was interested in merging and establishing a, a more national practice. And so for the last nine months of my term there, we I was part of the deal team, as they call it, uh, uh, putting together how does that merger work and what does it look like when it's all done and how do the, you know, the different share values work within the two firms. And we were able to successfully complete uh, that. And Harley Ellis Devereaux now, uh, based in Southfield, Michigan, is a well-respected national practice that does healthcare and education and a variety of other kinds of civic projects. And, yep, I'm familiar um, with the firm. Yeah, Craig, yeah, I want to I want to dive a little bit into the human side of that transition. Sure. So, thinking from empathizing with your situation, you're going into something new. Yeah, it's probably a little intimidating, even if you have all this industry experience behind you. It's something new; you've never done it before. Yeah. You, you're confident that you can accomplish it, but it's it's a new road. Would you tell me a little bit about you know kind of maybe the doubts you were having during that time and how you dealt with those doubts? And sure. what you decided to do when you hit the ground and started to yeah. implement things. Well, I, you know, it, you're absolutely right. It was, you're now you're doing, it was the old Monty Python, now for something completely different. <laughs> um, uh, when you work as a project-based uh, technology consultant, it's project-focused. You're, you know, each project is unique. You're working on that. When you're working on larger case mar- marketing strategy, you really have to lar- have a, a longer horizon. Um, and I had mentioned, you know, earlier, I'm a voracious reader. So I was... Um, reading everything I could on marketing theory. Um, people like Tom Peters um, and uh, a number of others, uh, Warren Bennis on leadership. There was you know, I, um, lots and lots of different sources of inspiration. But I looked for inspiration in uh, the, the kinds of long-term thinking that we weren't, we were, we, we were benefit at the, in 2003 until 2006, and then 2006 until about the middle of 2008, in both Harley Ellis and then with Leo Daly, with a market that was growing. Um, we'll talk about the recession in a little while. Um, but the, um, I don't know that I ever had serious self-doubts. I knew that from my experience, I'd been a member of SMPS, the Society of Marketing Professional Services, since 1985. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, group of uh, cohorts who are passionate about marketing and business development. I had developed a lot of friends in the industry. I was one of the first in 2003 to have the title of chief marketing officer uh, in the architectural side of the practices. Um, but there had been other marketing directors or the VPs of marketing or something on the uh, equivalent level uh, of large scale strategy. So that part, um, I knew I had uh, friends and resources I could call on if I got stuck. And I think that's, you know, one of the things we talked about when we started this series was the whole concept of collaboration. And I think no one is an island in this process of, of building buildings and, and, and developing client relations. 
It is a collaborative effort. And the more you can build a strong network of uh, cohorts and friends and resources that you can draw on as you need. I mean, you won't all draw on the same resources every time, but there'll be times when that uh, a resource will pop up that you know you can count on to, to help solve a particular problem. Uh, and that to me was always gave me the confidence to make that leap to do something new. Um, and, you know, and I had the, I think in marketing, when you're focused as a marketing professional, in a practice where whether you're in an architectural firm and everyone's a registered architect or many are, are the leaderships are registered architects, or if you're an engineering firm, they're registered PEs, or professional engineers. Um, marketing is often looked at as overhead and in many ways dismissed as administrative services by, by a lot of firms until they recognize that if they're not out generating new business, you don't have anything to work on unless you're going to take that role. And I re realized that was going back to a story we told before when I was promoted into running a small office. The phone doesn't ring. Um, there's no billable hours and you won't be sit paying the rent for very long um, if you're not finding ways to, uh, to do work. So um, part of my role was uh, to be, be the cheerleader to the practice leaders in the firm that you too can go to market. It's not just a business developer a non-technical business developer's role to go find work. It's the role of everyone in the firm to be a marketer. I learned that, uh, I were, had a benefit of working with Art Gensler a few times early in my career when he was still on the practice side of his now largest architectural practice in the world. Um, and, and he said that to me one day, he goes, everyone in our firm is a marketer. It's their interaction with whoever they have a touch point with outside of the office that tells our story from the receptionist to the project mm -hmm. manager to the person interacting with the blueprint service. Um, it's there. It's how they perceive the Gensler brand is how we're perceived in the world. Today's episode is sponsored by BQE Software, the developers of Archi Office. And until the end of December of this year, 2014, they're running a test. They want to see how responsive my audience is. So they approached me and they offered to give one lucky listener an iPad mini three. So let's show them the power of the business of architecture community. Let's show them that, yes, you are engaged. And, yes, that means you. Head on over to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash demo. Sign up for a free live walkthrough of ArchiOffice, and you will have the chance to win that iPad Mini 3 just in time for the new year. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming. So you're, you're, you go in it. You have this confidence because you do know you have a network. To fall back on, right. you know, you know, you're not going to get stuck where you'll get help. You know, what did you implement? Do you remember those early days to start to grow this firm? And tell me a little bit sure. about some of the specific tactics that you kind of implemented at well, that time. Yeah, well, like well, in, in any practice, I think if you don't have a strong strategic plan, um, you don't know where you're going. You need a roadmap, and that roadmap needs to be not top down, but but bottom up a roadmap that everyone agrees they want to participate in. Uh, in any practice, whether you're a one-person firm or a five-person firm, as soon as you have more than you, everyone needs to be engaged in the process of where we're going. Or you're not likely to get to have all those rows rowing in, oars rowing in the same direction. Um, and the uh, so in both uh, the, the firms I worked as chief marketing officer, my first goal was to establish a planning process that engaged uh, a wide, you can't get everyone in a 600 person firm or a 300 person firm, but you can get a cross section across the firm about what are the projects we're successful at, you know, in terms of where, you know, it, architecture is unique in the fact that we can pursue a project that is a one time design challenge. But if that one time design challenge costs you many more hours than it, than it pays you, ultimately that's not a way to make a successful living. Um, and I learned early on, it's the, you know, the bottom line is, is important. And there is a business of architecture, uh, as you have self-titled your own practice, that is important for firms to, to understand. Uh, we don't, we're not taught business very much in school. I, I had a business 101 class uh, at Cal Poly. And you were the uh, lucky one, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and so I think that the, the idea of, having a plan that, that, and there's lots of great references to 
strategic planning. I think you uh, interviewed Ray Kogan early on in one of your series. Ray is an author on strategic planning and one that I have worked with in the past as a planner uh, and a good one uh, and has published a couple of books. And uh, his former partner, Ellen Flynn Heaps, was another one that I was a mentor to me when I was uh, a young man uh, about the planning process. So implementing a plan. I have to tell you that, uh, and I know this will get um, shown on the, in, in the web. Once it's on the web, it's forever, right? So um, right. when I joined uh, Leo Daly, I, um, I asked the, the executive VP what it would take to be successful. And, and he said two things to me. Is one is we, we've we never had a strategic plan. I had asked, where's the plan? He said, we've never had one. So if you want one, you need to write one. I said, I'm not going to write it. We're going to write it. Mm. Um, and the other thing he said, and I think it was really insightful, was you need to become best friends with the chief operating officer. Because marketing can go sell anything. But if operations doesn't want to do it or doesn't know how to do it or can't do it well, we will fail. So we need to be respectful of the skill sets in the technical talent we have and sell into those skill sets to allow them to grow, but also to allow them to be successful. So finding projects that will um, uh, give them the opportunity to be successful. Ultimately, that drives profits and, and is the best result. So um, both firms was building a plan, sharing that plan, then communicating that plan to everyone, um, and then keeping that plan updated on a regular basis. So uh, on an annual, uh, we did a three-year plan, three-year look ahead, but we did an annual update. So we were always looking, what do we need to change that we now know that's different? And what's the new three-year look ahead? What's the horizon look like now? And that allowed us in, in 2008 at Leo Daily to start to make adjustments for a recessionary economy we saw coming. Um, we could see the downtrend in the subprime market, in the, in the residential market, as the subprime lending uh, started to fail. That started to trickle up into the commercial lending market. So you could see this, the uh, commercial markets start to get softer and softer. When the commercial markets got softer the, um, and, the, and the economy was starting to, to slow down, the public sector trough gets smaller. So the public, and it, and it just feeds on itself. Now, no one could have predicted the bank failures and the severity uh, of what happened. Uh, but we saw a trend line. Uh, and I'm a big believer in trend lines. I look at, uh, and, and I learned this from Peter Devereaux at, when I was with uh, Fields Devereaux, uh, 12 month uh, uh, average look aheads. Uh, look back and look ahead. So, you, you know, look back on, a, on a, what they call a trailing 12 month average but you're able to project that forward reasonably on a, on a linear basis uh, on about a three-month reasonable look ahead. So you can start to see a direction. I, I would call it a barometer instead of thermometer. Um, so you can see the direction it is going. So when your barometer says rain and you look out and it's blue skies, it means it's going to rain tomorrow. Um, and so we use that barometric, barometric uh, dashboard. And I use it now at Sexton as well. Um, to help look at uh, how we're doing, where we're going, and are we on the right path? And if we start to see a dip, then we start to look into the into the details of that. Of where's the dip happening? What's what is causing that uh, change? And how, what do we do to address it? Do we need to move into another market? Um, we, we see, as we've talked about in our, our previous show, a lot of uh, work in public higher education. Mm. That's about seventy five percent of the sector group's work. We are currently shifting our focus more into corporate sector as corporate as the recession i, I want to say it's over architects are a, a trailing um, indicator so we were last in and last out of the recessionary economy so many firms are start just starting now to feel the benefits of billings that look like 2008 mm -hmm. um, now 2014. Um, so we're we're looking at Corporate is getting better, and so we're investing time in building corporate relationships that will help us to, uh, as the, the reality of higher education is, the demographics of students is declining. So the amount of students coming into higher education is a number that's going down every year. So the demand really? for higher education really? buildings will go down in the next five years. We need to backfill. We'll still be, we've created a really terrific expertise in that area. But we want to be able to look at the growing healthcare uh, market. Um, I am a, a generation of the, of the baby boomers. Um, I'm going to, to be 
be demanding more and more healthcare services. So you are, as you know, you're a healthcare architect. Um, uh, the demand for healthcare buildings is going up. Uh, and so there's an area for us to play into a uh, technology area. So we've gone out and recruited staff with strong healthcare technology expertise that we can go help position to get ahead of that curve that we see happening in the next 10 years. A really big next boom is in healthcare architecture. Um, so. Excellent. Well, you answered my question. I was going to ask, what is the barometer saying? You, yeah. You preempted me. Yeah, well, it's it's. I would say, you know, I just wrote an article for SMPS for their December issue of their their journal on what 2015 looks like, um, and I and my conclusion was 2015 looks a lot like 2014, but a little bit better. Mm -hmm. uh, but 2014 was the first year where we could say in the last five years that it really felt better, um, that we saw a notable increase in in visible opportunities. The you know the, the we track. Uh, 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 the clients that are building buildings and look at what they've approved, what their capital budgets are, where where uh, buildings are going to be built. Uh, and that number has gone up markedly. And as a result, our long-term uh, client development and, and relationship development has generated more leads and more leads ultimately uh, leads to more work. And we've seen that number grow as well. And I've talked to my friends in architecture and engineering firms and almost everyone in the, in the what I'll call the first and second tier cities are all seeing similar trends. It's a better year. Uh, 2015 will be better still. Uh, no, no real canaries on the, uh, in the coal mine, as they say, uh, as there was in 2008 when the, you'd already seen the subprime uh, lenders go bankrupt. That was a canary that led to the, the uh, commercial lenders starting to really uh, tighten down on, on uh, financing. There's still, financing is still tight. So if you're in the development developer business, it's still a, a bit of a risk, but there's being a lot of A and B class office space built. Um, and so healthcare, education, government um, is still suffering a bit if you're in the federal sector and, and a certain amount of the state and county sectors as well uh, for lack of tax revenue mm -hmm. uh, to, to drive new buildings. They're finding new, you know, if they can get a bond passed, they can do new buildings, but uh, generally the federal is a little more of a, a holding still right now. Uh, international, if uh, any of the audience is international work, emerging markets are the are the big trend. Uh, stable markets like uh, Europe are still suffering. They're a little bit tra trailing to our success. I would say Europe's probably another couple of years away. The challenge I see, and I've been, as you know, in the industry since the uh, I interned in the early '70s and then started my practice in the in the late '70s. And the uh, 2009, 2010, 11 recession was my fifth, um, and uh, so, and you see them on average about once a decade. Um, and so if that's true, then, you know, in theory, um, bad theory, um, we might be looking at one in 2016 or 2017. So how do you prepare for the next downturn? Um, and uh, I have a, a good friend who's an economist who said, you know, in any downturn, there is always work. It's just less work than there was before. So you really need to be positioned with an expertise and a, and a strong client relationship and a strong network of collaborators to solve clients' problems when they have fewer dollars to spend and they need to make sure they spend them wisely. Excellent. You, you answered my other question I was going to have, which was, how do you guard against the future recession? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I use a, there's a, a a uh, Russian economist uh, from the 20s, 1920s, um, Nikolai, Nikolaus Kondratyev, um, who developed something called a long wave theory. And you can Google long wave theory and, and see this graph that he created. And he was, he, was, he, was, his, uh, he was fascinated with capitalism. And so the Russians threw him in the gulag. And so he had all this time, all this time to spend doing um, economic research. And he, was, he studied the United States economy from its founding to, uh, to that point, and then projected forward, that we have sort of a 50-year big cycle, um, this long wave of up and down and up and down. Um, and uh, unfortunately, if his, his prediction is right, the, the next um, down is going to be triggered by World War III. So, you know, I think maybe foxholes or bomb shelters might be the <laughs> next big architectural practice model to, to focus on. I, I'm, I'm not being serious here. 
But, um, but I think we have we are become much more of a global economy um, than ever before. And, you know, uh, the emerging nations are buying our products and services. Um, I'm seeing more firms uh, reach out to internationally to do work. So the more that we can spread our, our wings in a larger arena, uh, I know that's hard for a lot of your audience that are small uh, one and two person practices. Most of the architects in America are our small practice. But, you know, my advice is to uh, make sure that you're, you're conscious of what's going on in your local and regional economies uh, and, you know, be part of your economic development forums that are part of in your communities and your chamber of commerce and, and where areas where you can get information about trending stuff. So you can, you can get ahead of that too and find some niche practice opportunities. I love it. Craig, and you just brought something. I got a, an email the other day from a friend of mine who listens to the show, Randy Sovich, who practices out in Maryland, I believe. And he does own a smaller firm, and he was telling me that he now has landed a project over in Africa, a government contract doing some some cool housing. So he's yeah. going to come on the show, but I think that just brought to mind your example of how the opportunities may begin to increase as we right. get more globalized. Absolutely. And, and it's only your appetite as a practitioner. Uh, as to what where you want to reach, and I I counsel uh, uh, through SMPS we have an annual uh, I, I'll call it a counseling session at AIA where you can sign up for a 15 minute uh, marketing uh, review, um, and I sat with a half a dozen firms this year in in uh, Chicago uh, uh, and talked about where their practices were going, and almost all of them were you know l- less than 10 people, um, mm. and. Uh, and the advice was consistent and their, and their reaction was consistent was, you know, you need to get engaged in your community. You can't, you never can sit and wait for work. Uh, as, your, as your own uh, marketing academy tells the stories, you need to have an outreach program. You need to be visible and you need to share information that's valuable to those clients. If you can do that and invest your time, it pays back in, in spades, as they say, um, uh, uh, with, with work opportunities. Not all those will make sense, but... Um, uh, you never know when that, that Africa, or I just got one th- this week, uh, an architect we, we do education work for in Minnesota, uh, has a project in Costa Rica. Um, and I'm saying, I'm, I'm, you volunteered for that one. I got my passport ready. Yeah. Bust uh, out the old surfboard. Well, it's, I would tell you it's nine degrees in Omaha. I'm, Costa Rica sounds really good right now. Sounds very nice. I got, what what I, part are you at liberty to say what part of Costa Rica the project is in? It's in San Jose. Right there, San Jose is beautiful. Right. Right? So it's a university project uh, being developed near San Jose. Um, still um, very early in the development cycle, um, and so and 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 that's the other part. You, you have to give advice in marketing is this is a long process. The mm-hmm. uh, successful development of a relationship that leads to a building. Um, number of studies, um, uh, Gilbane Construction out of Rhode Island, a lar- very large national constructor did studies in 1990, 2000, 2010 on public sector and private sector clients about the firms they hired. What was the characteristics of the firms they hired to do their work? And in every case, consistently, all three over over 30 years, 20 years of, of surveys, was clients who had a nine to 12 month relationship with someone from the design practice, with a key decision maker at the client side, that was unrelated to the project itself, but was had provided information and value over a nine to 12 month period, 80% of the times that was the firm that was hired. So um, you're saying even even if the, the person, so if the architecture firm has a contact who's not necessarily involved in the actual selection, that still was the case? Well, it's, no, it has to be somebody whose influences are in a selection position. Okay. All right. The, so typically if I'm an architect, I want to talk to, the person who hires architects, of course, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, regardless of who that is, now it may be an administrative person, or it might be a facilities person, depends on the organization, it might be the owner of the house, you know that. Um, so where are they going? Are they going to the home shows to look for, um, you know, what what we're seeing? I think uh, an interesting sort of side note on this is that uh, I've observed as an outgrowth of the recession um, is that everyone got hungrier. Uh, it, the the amount of volume of work for both us as pr- practitioners, our clients and their work got smaller. And so we all got hungry, all got, we all got smarter, and we all got more focused. 
And so some peripheral folks in our field, um, in, in AEC, like um, the big commercial furniture manufacturers, um, now they're offering design services. Uh, mm -hmm. Residential general construction. Um, um, I just, a friend of mine, I was, I was talking about this and a friend sent me a, a picture of a, a billboard on the side of a, uh, a general contractor's site sign uh, for doing a, a residential multi-unit project. Underneath the sign, free architecture. So how do we educate the clients about the value of the professional service provider as opposed to someone peripheral to that, someone who has a product to sell or someone where uh, design is not their core competency? What's the difference? What is the value we bring? So it goes back to the whole idea of innovation and, and sustainability and all of the things that are, what are the hot buttons in the client's eyes uh, that, that we can speak to, uh, not just that we can create a pretty building. Well, I think you've opened up another can of worms there, Craig, which is oh, yeah. the change shifting nature of architects and the value in the industry. Now, what do you think about when we're, since we're talking about trends, I'm just going to, let's put this out here that, you know, I'm seeing, a, it seems I'm seeing in developing nations, a little bit of upward mobility. They're wanting to bring in outside expertise. So, yes. for instance, I was surprised at the AI convention to see a large contingency from Nigeria of Nigerian mm -hmm. architects who have a lot of money right now in their country because of the yeah. oil and gas petroleum industry. Right. But they don't have that long history of having trained architects who are experienced in healthcare, who are experienced in industrial projects. And so they're basically, they're just like a sponge looking for this expertise. And uh, you mentioned that Costa Rica brought up a similar idea there. So if these developing nations are demanding more expertise, how do you see the global, you know, it, are there going to be more opportunities for architects to outsource their expertise to some of these nations? Do you see any trend there? Yeah, I do. And I, I think you, you've hit it on the nose, is that as the emerging markets, the um, the BRICS, as they call them, in the Brazil, Russia, uh, India, uh, China, uh uh, continue to grow, and we see now in Africa and Central America, Argentina as well, um, uh, growing, is that my position has been with the firms I've worked with is if we're going to be successful internationally, the easiest way to get there is on the coattails of a domestic client who is working internationally. That allows us to work with a client we know we've been successful with domestically, um, and then we can work on their facilities internationally. When we're over there doing their work, we can do some outreach into who else wants to do buildings like this or who else is doing building like this and start to make local connections. Um, that You can leverage those relationships you build at an AIA conference with someone. Um, you know, I, I didn't talk to the architect about how he built or got the, the relationship in Costa Rica. I, I, I need to ask that question. It's a good one. Uh, but I know in our case, we are taken to um, overseas a lot based on a, a domestic experience. So we're currently working for a large um, national technology company on their domestic facilities. Um, they've already said, we want to replicate what we're doing in the United States in our Brazil and Argentina offices. So be prepared to send a team down to work on that. Um, when we're there, we will spend some time. And I will tell you, pro proactively, the other side of that is we just spoke at two conferences, one in Colombia and one in uh, Buenos Aires, um, on healthcare technology. So the other way to do it is to find the audiences of buyers um, and go present. Put yourself in uh, front of them. Put, you put yourself, it's, you know, it's, you need to be confident in what you say. You need to, you know, if you can tell a, not just a theory story, but a true story, we've talked about stories before, uh, showing features, benefits, and proofs um, and, you know, of the results, uh, then that resonates. Uh, mm -hmm. And guaranteed, you will get inquiries and uh, and have opportunities. You have to weigh cost of doing work overseas uh, is a challenge, and most of those firms that have been doing work internationally for a long time will say, "How do you get your money out? Is, is there you know uh, currency exchange issues? Is there China getting money out altogether is a challenge? It has to be reinvested in order to get it out back to the United States. It's not an easy process." Um, so be careful what you wish for mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and and places that are risky you know they um uh there's a lot of rebuilding going on in the mid east um high risk areas to go to but the uh 
Corps of Engineers needs architectural services to go over and rebuild airports and uh, build hospitals and build schools? And are you putting your staff at risk when you do that? Um, so, so there's a pros and cons of that, that yeah. potential. I, I think we're in a, in a really nice place right now, for at least for the next year or two, uh, for sure, that we're seeing growth domestically at a level that um, there's, there's work here. Um, if we're if you're big enough to have an appetite to go internationally, there's work there too. Yeah, uh, well, so. I I appreciate it, Craig. And my I'm just gonna my takeaway from our conversation today, and everyone's gonna get something different, yeah. and that's the beauty of these kind of conversations. But is that there are plenty of opportunities out there, and they're only increasing. But yeah. it seems to take to take advantage of them. We need to be focused, and we need to we're better off niching down and focusing on a specific opportunity as they increase, as opposed to trying to go with the shotgun approach and chase Absolutely. after everything that comes across our desk. Absolutely. Yeah. There's, if you don't have a relationship with a client um, at all, just responding to an RFQ or an RFP, for my mind, is a waste of money. Yeah. You're better off spending the time and money to go take that client to lunch to be positioned for their next project. Yep. Um, lunch and lunch and lunch and a round of golf. There you so, go. Yeah. Craig Great. Park, thank you for joining us. Craig Thanks, Park David. is an, the leader of an independent technology consultancy firm. He leads their Midwest operations from his Omaha, Nebraska office, the Sextant Group. You can find out more about Craig Park or connect with him over at craigpark.com and thevirtualcmo.com. So, Craig, thanks for joining us on the Business of Architecture. Thank you, Andy. It was a pleasure. You bet. And that's a wrap for another show about the Business of Architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.